the North Star for the State Board and MSDE has and has and continues to be to provide safe full-time instruction with minimal disruption for our students. During last summer, MSDE and MDH in concert with the local school systems issued layered COVID-19 mitigation guidance, which included the proper use of face coverings as recommended by the CDC and MDH to address the emergency. At that point, it was clear that our intent was to listen to the science and follow the science. Watching school closures and education disruptions nationally, and as the board became aware that a few local systems were at risk for not following the layered guidance, the state board decided to act and passed an emergency regulation at our August 26, 2021 meeting and the AELR approved it on September 14, 2021. That regulation was scheduled to expire on February 25th, 2022. In November, to obtain information about the state of emergency, the State Board convened a special meeting to gather diverse input from parents, parent organizations, school administrators, local board leaders, and the union. We also heard from MDH and a panel of nationally recognized health and medical experts. Still in the emergency and based in large part on their input, the state board passed a new regulation, including three types of off ramps, which the ALR approved on January 5th, 2022. It's important to note that the state board issued the new not to exceed 180 day face covering regulation with off ramps during the Omicron surge. We did this because we believe that conditions would improve gradually across the state, but not evenly. The emergency regula regulation contemplated an improving environment in which face coverings would no longer be needed in school facilities to ensure uh, schools remain open as we learn to live with the virus. As a transition to the ultimate lifting of face covering requirement, these research-based off-ramps allow local superintendents and school boards to unilaterally lift the requirement as the emergency lessened in their jurisdictions. With the improving COVID-19 metrics throughout Maryland, higher vaccination rates, more rapid testing availability, as well as vaccines on the horizon for younger children, as reported by MDH and MSDE. And then on the recommendation of MSDE, the state board determined at our February 22nd board meeting that it was, the time was right to return decision-making on the face coverings to the local boards of education. The state board holds the local boards in the highest regard and we continue to expect these boards to exercise their authority in a responsible manner as the virus ebbs and flows. In addition, the state board will continue to receive monthly updates from MSDE on the COVID-19 school logistics and transmission uh, data. As a final note, this is not my first exposure to the concept of a pandemic. About 20 years ago, I was pulled into a group that President Bush commissioned to start planning for man-made and natural disasters, such as pandemics. Therefore, I have a very basic understanding of the current environment and how things can and will change based on how the virus mutates, better treatments, expanded immunity, and a greater understanding of the illness. I wanna thank the committee again for its support and thank the committee for this opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our state superintendent, Mr. Uh, Chaudhary. Mr. Chaudhary, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Crawford. Thank you, uh, Chair Elfrith. Uh, good to see you again. And, and uh, Chair Rosenberg. Um, I will uh, be brief as well uh, with my remarks. Um, so right off the bat, again, I want to thank uh, Chair President Crawford and members of the State Board uh, for their steadfast leadership um, during this challenging time and the members of this committee uh, for your partnership in taking action to protect the safety of our schools and students this year. With the goal of protecting the health of all members of the education community and ensuring a safe return to in-person learning for every child, the face covering requirement issued through the emergency regulation was necessary in the face of high community spread. The lack of a vaccine for children under the age of 12, limited testing opportunities, and the emergence of the Omicron variant, all experienced during the first part of the 21-22 school year. Uh, the face covering requirement helped keep all of our schools open throughout the fall as many schools and entire districts closed around the country and it helped our school systems weather the Omicron surge and pr pr preserve in-person learning for the vast majority of our students. We continue to emerge from the pandemic and transition to an environment that now includes readily available vaccines for school-aged children, ample testing opportunities, and a greater depth of understanding of COVID-19 and its impact. The time has come to return to local leaders. Um, in addition to this, just now as Chair Crawford was uh, speaking, I was monitoring uh, if the new CDC uh, guidance is coming out. And um, so uh, we now have an understanding of where they are going to land, right? This, the CDC uh, will release new guidelines uh, this uh, today uh, for determining when and where people should wear masks, uh, practice social distancing and avoid crowded indoor spaces, a framework that's in intended to move the country to a long-term strategy that uh, where, where lives uh, can uh, persist through what they're calling a new normal. Um, according to uh, their new guidance, um, it will be, it will no longer rely on uh, the number of cases in a community to determine the need uh, for restrictions such as mask wearing. Instead, they will direct counties to consider three measures to assess risk in, uh, of the virus. And I want to make sure I get this right. New COVID-related hospital admissions over the previous week and the percentage of the hospital beds occupied by COVID patients, as well as new coronavirus cases per 100,000 people over the previous week. Using that framework, right, Maryland is in a great place right now. Um, and, and I think the time is right. Um, I'm very proud of, of, of the original regulation. I said it, if I could go back, I, I would do it with the, with the conditions it had. Um, and it did what it needed to do. And it also started a conversation about off ramps. Uh, we may have been last to reopen all of our schools um, early on, but we were not last to think about off ramps. And, and it's great to see that school systems have begun exercising it. Howard um, has hit the metric. They just decided the other night they're going to lift it just based on the current regulation. And Arundel has done it. Frederick has done it. Um, and um, others are choosing to take a different approach. Baltimore County is going to use the 14-day approach. Um, uh, they will have they will update that based on the CDC framework. And then just today, Prince George has said that they are going to um, uh, basically once they get to that low trans 80% uh, vaccine designation rate at the county, that's when they will feel comfortable doing it. And others, um, uh, we will let locals decide with these improving conditions. Again, um, the time is right, um, and um, I'm proud of the work that we've done. Um, but like I said, uh, we can't mask our kids forever. This is a, a, a good time to do it. Um, and with that, um, I thank you for your consideration, and I stand ready to take any and all questions. Thank you. First question is from Delegate Learman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you uh, to both of you for being here. Um, I'm sort of thinking back to the last hearing that we had and the promise from both of you that it was our last hearing on this issue. Um, and it was the last hearing on this issue because there were off ramps provided. And as you said, those off ramps were going to give local jurisdictions the ability to stop masking. So I'd like to understand what changed, um, why we're here, um, and uh, just, yeah, give you a chance to redeem your broken promise. <laughs> well, I don't, you want to go first, Chair Crawford? 
Because okay. I don't think I broke my promise. I, I said I, I would no longer bring you a new emergency regulation. Program. That's <laughs> what we were saying. And our hope was that at the time, that with the possibility of, of an improving environment, there would not be a need to come back for a new regulation or a new emergency regulation. And that's what our hope was. So far, um, it looks like we're on track. What has changed? I think uh, the, again, as, as the superintendent said, and, and from my prior experience from 20 years ago, when you're dealing with an environment like this, you have a lot of moving parts. And what has happened is I think what the superintendent has said with the vaccinations, with the immunities, and I think also with our better understanding of the virus and what it means and better ways to track and anticipate. So I, as I say, we, we thank you very much and we greatly appreciate your support, but our intent was that we were hoping not to come back for a new regulation to extend face coverings. That was our sincere hope. I, only thing I will add is, I don't think I broke the promise, Delegate Learman. Uh, I, I came to end the regulation earlier. Um, and the reason I say this is I'm a new father and my daughter was born a couple of weeks ago and I don't want her to think I break promises. I, I did not break the promise. I, I'm coming here to, and the regulation early because I think the conditions are right and 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 it did what it needed to do. But and and like I said, you, you know, one of the things um, you'll get to know me, I like to benchmark. I'm not gonna, you know, I benchmark against the, the places in the country that did things responsibly, yep. um, Massachusetts, and they're 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 landing in the same place. And and I know you believe in the research. Yeah, no, I do. I mean, I absolutely believe in the research. I'm just surprised to be back here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you, Delegate. And uh, Mr. Superintendent, I know I speak for all of us when I say congratulations on the birth of your daughter. It's very exciting. Senator Eckert. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. President. And uh, Dr. Chowdhury, I appreciate that we're back here and we're going to hopefully rescind this. So I want to thank you for that. But I want to be really clear. Um, you're asking us to eliminate um, the order completely, correct? There are no additional off ramps. All of that is now going to be left up to the decision and of the local county authorities, correct? That is correct. They can use the off ramps as guidance, but as far as a statewide uh, regulation, we're asking you to allow us to rescind it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. We are going to lift that mandate, correct? I believe that's up to you. <laughs> that's to vote. It's your Thank vote. you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Sample Hughes followed by Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I too am um, surprised we're back here at this setting on this afternoon, but nonetheless, I do have a question. Um, you just responded to Senator Eckert as it related to um, the usage of our local Board of Education's uh, using the off ramps options. That's optional, is my understanding. Uh, with that uh, being said, I did have a meeting this morning uh, with the Eastern Shore Delegation superintendents, and I asked the question, if they were knowledgeable of the percentage of children vaccinated in their schools or their staff or any information um, that they are given in order to make you know sound decisions or just really know the lay of the land of their schools. Um, so with that being said, can you respond to um, if our superintendents will be equipped with that information so they can share that with their principals um, so they can utilize the off ramps information um, and, and utilize that information in a most succinct possible way? If they wanted to, uh, so they collect um, every month, I come to the state board to present uh, COVID-19 data. And so our school systems um, 
do in varying ways. Uh, we, we were not a state that collected COVID data in a standardized way. Um, um, so uh, the State Department of Ed created a, a, a tool to get the self-reported data. So we do have teacher vaccination data um, and that's high in the 80s and 90s. We don't have, we have uh, the general uh, data from MDH of what percentage of our uh, students uh, who are currently eligible, our children eligible for vaccines, uh, the five and up um, and what that number is fully vaccinated. At the individual school level, no, um, it is not a routine vaccine, vaccine um, uh, requirement at, uh, in the, um, here in Maryland. Um, um, and, and it's not common yet across the country in some places, but we did create an off ramp if they wanted to at the individual school level, they could. And that was built off of the Massachusetts model. So they could just go ahead and look at, you know, collect uh, the cards and then ultimately add up to see if 80% of the staff. But in terms of someone tracking individual school level, no, that, that doesn't exist because it's not part of the routine series uh, right now. But that off ramp was available, uh, but they do have. Have, uh, you know, we do have general county data uh, by jurisdiction on what percentage of kids are vaccinated and such. Okay, just for clarity, so the individual school district can access information on the percentage of their kids vaccinated to be able to respond to that 80% off ramp. Is that not correct? That is correct if they choose to exercise that off ramp. Um, uh, there is nothing, and that does not violate FERPA or anything. Um, if they choose to do that, they, they, they could. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, seeing no other members who currently have their hands raised, uh, we will proceed to public testimony. Senator Alfred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we're going to call witnesses in four at a time and there was we appreciate there was a bit of confusion in how to sign up so we might it's not being called up per se in favorable or unfavorable so i ask the committee for your indulgence there we're going to call first call adam mr Wind, windham uh miss norcaratis i apologize miss weiner and miss sharp and a reminder to the committee that you should have received in your email box your inboxes last night, all the written testimony that we received as formally as well as informal emails that we've received regarding this regulation. So I would ask that you please look at that testimony as well as the testimony we'll hear today. So with that, um, Mr. Windham, good to see you. Good morning, good, sorry, good, good afternoon. And I apologize, we're gonna stick to uh, about two minutes uh, per witness, if that's okay. Or two minutes, I thought it was three, I prepared a three minute speech. I might have budget and tax mind on. I think three, if, if Chair Rosenberg agrees, three is okay. That's three is fine. okay. Okay. Thank you. What is equity? In response to a question back in October by AECPS board member, Dr. Tobin, about the difference between equality and equity, the AECPS executive director of equity, Dr. Gillens, told the Board of Education that equity was making sure everyone has a shoe that fits. Many reports around the state show mass mandates, just like virtual learning, has been anything but equitable, especially for special needs students. Students are experiencing increased mental health concerns. Those with autism are experiencing increased behavioral anxiety episodes. Students are experiencing speech delays. As an exa a specific example, an IEP progress report from this year states masks were worn by the therapist and student and that wearing masks make evaluating and imitating proper sound productions difficult. The progress report showed the student with 0% accuracy on one objective and 25% on another. These are only some of the many examples out there. Proponents of mask mandates will make emotional arguments and say things like, well, my student's doing just fine. This denies the very concept of equity at its core and only serves to prolong the many inequities that existed in special education, even before COVID. School districts made it very difficult and intimidating to even apply for a mask exemption. There was little to no advertisement of how to even apply for an exemption. Websites of one county clearly stated completion of the application grants permission to contact your medical provider. And the application was not even an exemption request. It was a quote, coaching request. While the following numbers might have changed slightly, just two weeks ago, parents were told mask exemptions were not granted for things such as speech delays or anxiety concerns. 
As of September 9th, AECPS had 712 applications submitted. Only three were for religious reasons. Only 60 exemptions were granted, 138 denied, and hundreds others were forced on the coaching plans. 47 were still pending at the time. And many did not even bother applying. One of the assistant state superintendents replied to the same email from me you all received on this issue. The email response was a typical bureaucratic deflection of responsibility. MSDE and this committee does not get to deflect responsibility on this. Suggesting parents use due process or other means that they disagree with mass exemption decisions is the very definition of an inequitable and unjust system. Not everyone has the time, means, or money to fight systems seemingly designed to make it difficult and have lawyers on full-time retainer. Mm -hmm. You all chose to micromanage the mask issue and then ignore the real problems it caused. Again, equity is making sure the shoe fits. The shoe certainly has not fit for the last two years. And this is why I call for immediately eliminating the mask mandates at every level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wyndham. We appreciate you participating today. Ms. Norkitis, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, that was actually correct. <laughs> Okay, so uh, good afternoon, uh, committee members of the Administrative Executive Legislative Review. Uh, my name is Liliana Norkaitis. I'm a senior at Falston High School in Hartford County, and I'm asking for your favorable report. Um, and I, with the confusion, I want the mask mandate rescinded. Um, I still vividly remember the day of March 15, 2020, when students were excited to be off from school for two weeks. And I left, as, I left school as a sophomore and returned as a junior who was so eager to get back to the classrooms. I didn't try to argue the mask mandate. I went all summer being able to breathe outside and not mask because the state mandate was rescinded. Yet at the start of my senior year, I was frustrated that the population with the best immune systems were still forced to mask. Mm -hmm. Hartford County had also rescinded the ma countywide mask mandate, and I was able to attend county council meetings and a few board of education meetings without wearing a mask. I can go to other states that have higher positivity rates than Maryland and not have to be mandated. I can go to the grocery store, movie theater, or gym that, and not have to wear a mask but apparently a classroom is more prone to COVID than public places where hundreds of people go to daily. The place that it made no sense to continue wearing a mask was the school, and it is exactly what we have been doing for a year. Maryland has collectively vaccinated over 80% of the eligible population, and the positivity rate over the last few weeks has been at record lows since the pandemic started. I, along with many other students, are ready to move past the mask mandate while respecting the students who will still continue to wear a mask. We are now two years into the pandemic, waiting for it to completely go away. The science proves that COVID will never completely go away. We must learn to live with the virus and remove the masks from the, one of the few populations still mandated to do so. It is more than the right time to allow students to breathe, smile, and see each other's faces for the first time in over two years. When I graduate with my class in June, I want to be able to walk across the stage mask-free, smiling over the accomplishments I have made over the last 13 years in education. I am sure that many of the testifiers today will be parents, but if they are not enough to sway your favorable report, I ask that you listen to someone who is directly affected by this mandate and having to wear a mask for over 30 hours a week. I have taken the precautionary measures I felt were right in protecting myself against COVID-19, along with 80% of Marylanders. When I saw the update from the Maryland State Department of Education that they voted to rescind the mask mandate with a vote of 12 to 2, I was overjoyed. I was sitting in AP statistics when I received the email and the class was excited when I read the headline. I then got less excited when I learned of all the hoops that must be gone through before being able to take our masks off. I do support checks and balances, um, but I am testifying today for all the students in Harford County and the state of Maryland that want the choice back in public schools as to whether they want to wear a mask or not. I'm ready to unmask and I'm asking for your favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nocritus. Uh, we greatly appreciate when students and young people participate in our process. So thank you for being here and thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Weiner, did I do that correctly? Okay. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Jennifer Weiner and I'm the mom of two Carroll County Elementary School students. I also have a third daughter who's four years old and she's the reason that I'm speaking today. You have probably noticed fewer voices in favor of masks for this meeting than you heard during your last two meetings on this topic. Back in September, we had no vaccine for children under the age of 12. I've seen that even the most vocal mask advocates lose their enthusiasm once their own children can be protected. I get it, they're tired. 
We're all tired of COVID. And those of us with children under the age of five are exhausted. And yet we can't move on because we still don't have a vaccine for this age group. Children under five represent 15% of pediatric COVID cases and 35% of pediatric COVID deaths. In the United States, more than 400 children in this age group have died from COVID and many others are experiencing long-term complications from infection. Here in Maryland, we've had 20 pediatric COVID deaths, almost half of them during the Omicron wave. While Maryland hospitalizations are quickly declining overall, pediatric hospitalizations are creeping back up. As of today, there are 16 pediatric COVID hospitalizations and six of them are in the ICU. Masks work. They are a simple tool. And in places like Carroll County, where all other mitigation has been abandoned and there is no virtual option, they are all we have to protect our most vulnerable citizens. My four-year-old puts on her little yellow mask to go to preschool with no issues. She even wears it properly, which is more than I can say for most adults. In January, you all voted to keep this regulation with some very reasonable off-ramps. Several counties in Maryland have already met those off-ramps. They're clearly not unattainable. We've already seen that the Carroll County Board of Education cannot be trusted to act responsibly with regard to face coverings. I know that a common argument is that my kids can still wear masks if they are optional. We all know that masks work best when everybody wears them. And we all know the power of peer pressure and bullying. It's not easy to be the only child in a class wearing a mask. And it shouldn't be my six-year-old's responsibility to keep her little sister safe. That's my job and your job. Please do your job and protect our most vulnerable citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weiner. And who, who's that with you? If you could. <laughs> this is this is my daughter, Franny. She's my four-year-old. Hi, She's Franny. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Say hi. Hi. Great job. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sharp. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? I was grateful to say that MSDE decided to recommend ending the mask mandate for school kids and also grateful that you were able to come together for this meeting so quickly. My appealing to you today seems unnecessary as as best as I can tell you're set to agree with MSDE whether or not I ask you to. Some counties are making the same assumption as they have announced their intentions to rescind their county school mask mandates just as soon as you say they can. I hope in your minds that this vote is a very simple decision. It should be an easy decision when you keep in mind all that we have learned in the last two years. For example, we've learned that the risk of COVID is age stratified. So if anything, we've been overestimating the danger of COVID for kids. We've tried too hard to keep them safe. These last two years, we've learned that trying to protect kids has in some ways done more harm than good. In school, teachers are compelled to prioritize mask enforcement over teaching. We see the harm as behavioral, social, speech, educational, and other problems increase. We see testing and achievement scores plummet. Your vote today will begin to heal some of the damage kids have suffered these last two years, or it will at least eliminate masking as one variable. Maybe you're voting to take masks off because you have become aware that if they ever were useful, for sure they are not now against Omicron. Even the CDC says studies are scarce that confirm the effectiveness of cloth masks beyond theoretical modeling and in the real world. Maybe today you're just looking at the numbers and thinking that, thank goodness, the worst is behind us. The sun is shining and so it finally can shine on my kid's face too. If you approve MSDE's request, mask optional doesn't preclude some people who still want to wear high quality masks from doing that. One way masking protects the wearer without requiring everyone else to, something else maybe we're just beginning to realize. Your vote today communicates moving past previous policies we relied on when we knew less. It acknowledges we have acquired more tools to fight COVID and perhaps with natural and vaccine induced immunity, we are less vulnerable than before. I'm grateful that you seem to be aware of all these facts and with your vote, you are allowing Maryland schools to adjust their policies accordingly. I hope your example will give counties in Maryland confidence to move forward. I'm thinking particularly now of Calvert County whose school board just last night voted three to two to ignore MSDE, Governor Hogan, Superintendent Chowdhury, Mr. Pat Nutter, much of the modern world, and after your vote today, you. 
Thank you, nevertheless, for your vote today to let masks be optional for kids. And with my last five seconds, I want to say instead of Tuesday, please now. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. And just for the folks at home, and our council can correct me, but the however we vote one way or another, it would immediately go, that impact would go immediately into effect. Awesome. Okay. Chair Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the next four people in this order, Ryan Thompson, Heather Fletcher, Megan Jones, Carol Vidal. Mr. Thompson, Ryan Thompson. It would immediately go that. Go ahead, please, Mr. Thompson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Brian Thompson. I'm chair of the Concerned Parents of Carroll County and I have four children in the public school system. I'm here today because I want masks off my children, but I'm not going to go and spend the time, go through all the reasons why. I'm not going to go and beg and plead because I already know how today's meeting is going to end. Each of you, with the few exceptions, will go around the room and talk about how the science has changed, how it's time to return to normal, but still try to save face and rationalize why masking my kids for over two years was necessary to keep schools open, despite evidence of the contrary. We know very well that the decision you're about to make today has nothing to do with the changing medical science and has everything to do with the changing political science. You looked at the polls showing overwhelming resistance to school masking. You saw the 46 other states that already voted to remove masks. You saw the news media changing their positions. And lastly, you saw the lawsuits that our county and the Coalition of Maryland uh, Parents filed challenging the legality of the emergency regulation. So please, save us from the theatrics and the choreographed statements. Don't try to cover this up. And just admit that what you did to my children was not only unnecessary, but abusive. Don't repeat the same talking points of Superintendent Chowdhury who continues to maintain, I've given the chance to mask my kids for two years again, he'd do it, despite the data showing the mask did nothing to prevent the spread. Don't spread lies like the board president, Clarence Crawford, who continues to claim that the emergency regulation was needed to save counties that didn't have the mask mandate, when clearly it was to save themselves from the political embarrassment of counties like Carroll showing them that their policies didn't work. But unfortunately for Mr. Crawford, we have data available to us from across the country and across the globe that he can still be embarrassed by. So please, Vote to remove the mask, and parents and teachers will be thrilled to see our kids smiling faces again. But understand that the issues you face go well beyond masking and even COVID. Our State Department of Education and this committee face an erosion of public trust. We now see you for who you really are, and it's clear who our government and education bureaucrats serve. And newsflash, it's not our children. So the question is that I ask today is not how you're going to vote, but what is it that you will do tomorrow? How will you regain public trust? And more importantly, how will you ensure that this abuse of power by unelected bureaucrats like Superintendent Chaudhry never happens again? We're not asking you to figure this out. We're demanding that you do. Pass legislation to protect our constituents and protect my children from this abuse of power. The public and the, especially the parents have woken up and we're watching you. Do your job or we will elect real leaders that will. In local jurisdictions like Carroll County and parent groups from across this great state We'll continue to take every legal action possible so that our children never have to suffer from the consequences of your political games ever again. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Ms. Fletcher. Hello. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I'm asking that you vote to rescind the emergency regulation mass mandate immediately. Since your last meeting on January 5th, the Biden administration has shifted its focus from trying to prevent all COVID-19 infections to trying to prevent serious illness and death from COVID-19. This is their new strategic strategy for handling the virus as it becomes endemic. The WHO stated on January 25th, 2022, that the evidence on deaths directly attributable to COVID-19 infection is strongly age-dependent with children and adolescents least affected. On February 8th, 2022, Dr. Lena Wayne Wen from George Washington University told CNN that there was and is a time and place for pandemic restrictions, but when they were put in, it was always with the understanding that they would be removed as soon as we can. And in this circumstances, this, um, in this case, circumstances have changed. 
The responsibility should shift from a government mandate imposed by the state or the local district of the school, and it should swift, shift excuse me, to the individual responsibility by the family, who can still decide that their child can wear a mask if needed. She also added, but we should also be intellectually honest and say that masking has had a cost, especially for the youngest learners, people with English as a second language, children with learning disabilities. There has been a cost to them. So the risk benefit calculation has really changed, she said. On February 10th, 2022, Governor Larry Hogan wrote a letter to the State Board of Education and said a growing number of medical professionals, parents, and bipartisan state officials throughout the nation are calling for an end to mass school mask requirements. Public health experts who previously advocated for mandating masking in schools now calls for eliminating these temporary measures. The Maryland State Board of Education voted 12 to 2 on Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022, to lift the statewide school mask mandate and allow local school boards to adopt their own policies. State Superintendent Mohammed Chowdhury told the board that he felt it was the right time to return control over mass mandates to local school districts. I agree. The time is now to return the control to the local school boards, and I believe this control should never be taken away again. The lockdowns, mandates, and restrictions that have been put in place by our government have had devastating effects on our children. We will probably never know the full extent of the harm that has been caused, but I'll give you a glimpse. Two of the three priorities listed on the State Board of Education's agenda on Tuesday were COVID learning loss and mental health in schools, and suicide prevention and safety training was also an agenda line. These topics should be serious red flags to the real dangers that are facing our kids. On February 18th, 2022, the CDD, sorry, CDD, sorry, CDC released a report called Pediatric Emergency Department visits associated with mental health conditions before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. The report states in 2021, a national emergency for children's mental health was declared by several pediatric health organizations and the U.S. Surgeon General released an advisory on mental health among youths. These actions resulted from ongoing concerns about children's mental health in the United States, which, which was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. During March, through October 2020, among all emergency department visits, the proportion of mental health related visits increased by 24% among US children, ages five to 11 and 31% mental health has increased among adolescents aged 12 to 17 compared with 2019. On the same day, the CDC released another article titled Pediatric Emergency Department Visits Before and During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And they said, although there was some variation by pandemic year, increases in visits with certain injuries, injuries across all age groups, including firearm injuries, 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 as well as among children and adolescents aged 5 through 17 years, drug poisoning and self-harm are consistent with reports of increased overdose and violence outcomes during the pandemic. I will end with this. This year's Super Bowl brought a capacity crowd of more than 70,000 people to the SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California. The stadium was full of people eating, drinking, screaming, hugging without masks on. Yet our children in Maryland had to go to school the following day in masks. When they made a conscious decision not to limit the number of fans in attendance to the Super Bowl, they were also Please saying to the rest of America that there is no health emergency. The emergency is over. Please rescind your emergency regulation mask mandate and let our children breathe. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Jones. Megan Jones. Sorry, my name just updated in the system, so that's me. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm here today on behalf of Disability Rights Maryland, Maryland's Protection and Advocacy Agency for Individuals with Disabilities. Disability Rights Maryland opposes the withdrawal of the State Board of Education's emergency regulation concerning face coverings in schools. The emergency that necessitated the promulgation of this regulation is ongoing and the regulation in effect carefully balances the rights of various students, including students who need mask exceptions. Additionally, the off ramps in the regulation currently allow districts to exercise local control while keeping students safe. MSDE and the state board have expressed a belief that the re regulation did what it needed to do. However, for students with disabilities, this is not the case. We represent students with disabilities who are eligible for a free and appropriate public education, students like that four-year-old that you saw on camera earlier, some of whom are still too young to be vaccinated. 
These students cannot safely attend school unless off ramps are met or masking is continued. If this regulation is withdrawn, the choice for parents in districts like Carroll County that has already expressed intent to remove this regulation or remove the masking requirement will be to risk their children's lives or accept minimal home instruction, often no more than six hours a week. Many districts do not have virtual programs, do not have virtual programs that are accessible to students with disabilities or don't have programs that will accept students mid-year. As this committee acknowledged when it approved the emergency regulation, the state board was within its authority to implement the emergency regulation and has designated specific off-ramps to allow districts to choose to end masking once certain research-based metrics have been met. Several districts have exercised this power and plan to remove mask mandates in accordance with the existing emergency regulation. The board, in responding to pressure from local school districts that have not met these research-based metrics, in moving to end the regulation early, is stepping away from its responsibility to achieve a safe and healthy environment for all of Maryland's students. If this emergency regulation is withdrawn early, it will create an unsafe environment for many Maryland students and will exclude some students with disabilities from attending school. The regulation remains necessary to prevent discrimination against students with disabilities in all Maryland public schools that have not yet met the re regulation's research-based offerings. We urge you to decline to withdraw the emergency regulation currently requiring masking. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Ms. Vidal. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We Thank make you. the same mistake. You're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for having uh, allowing me to talk today and good afternoon. My name is Carol Vidal and I'm a parent of two children in public schools, a physician and a pediatric psychiatrist, but I'm here as a parent and not representing my employer or any professional organizations. I'm here to strongly support MSDE's lifting of the state mask mandate in Maryland public schools. Masks should be optional and a decision made by the local boards. My personal op opinion on this topic is nonpartisan. I have been a registered Democrat up until recently, um, up until this year, and I actually testified for a gun law just this Wednesday. I have an agenda and it is just to protect children. Maryland started out this pandemic with a reasonable conservative approach when we didn't know how the virus behaved. But it became a state of shame when it closed public schools for over a year, being the third from the bottom to reopen in the country. And it has now turned into a cold to COVID state, being again among the last states to unmask children. While first graders are masked in schools, they go to play dates with their school peers without masks and live with parents and grandparents who go about their lives being unmasked, even at the gym. And of course, again, this masking is no longer happening in private schools, only public schools. Omicron these cases are down, and while COVID can cause severe disease in adults and people with underlying medical conditions, the risk for healthy children is already very low, and vaccines drive the risk nearly to zero. High-risk individuals can continue to be protected by vaccination, boosters, and N95 masks that protect the individual, with focused protection like we have always done with respiratory viruses. But also, well-controlled real-world studies, not the ones that you do with a mannequin in a lab, have not demonstrated benefit of masking students. The students of the studies often cited to support masking show benefits that are not statistically significant, which means that they work as much as they don't work, and they don't do not consider vaccination rates in the community, which is actually what matters. When an intervention's real-world benefits are so small, we can feel comfortable ending its use. As of now, at least 14 school districts are waiting for this committee to lift the state mask mandate. We have counties like Moco County with a 85% vaccination rate, one of the highest in the country, and still masking students. But most districts have been reasonable in their approach when given the chance. And for consistency, since the state did not have a say in reopening schools last year, it should not have a say in masking kids in public schools in Maryland. We don't exactly understand the breadth of the long-term effects of prolonged masking in children while in school, but at the minimum, we can say that masks in schools are not the solution, that COVID is here to stay, and that everyone else is unmasking in the state, with children being at a very low risk for severe disease from this virus, it's past time to allow them to also unmask and to allow their teachers to unmask. If we didn't do this now, when will we do it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, if staff could please let in Ms. Edmondson, Ms. Hart, Ms. Persons, Ms. Stonesifer, and Ms. Gosharn please. And while those folks are entering the room uh, to the committee, 
Um, it's a reference that the CDC, we expected them to release new guidelines today. The staff, a quick, uh, while we don't have those guidelines in full, we do have a New York Times article that received in advance of those guidelines. The staff has PDF that article and it will be in your inboxes. And I would encourage you at some point to read that. Okay, Miss Edmondson. Oh, that's me. Hello. Hi. Sorry. That's okay. Welcome. Hello. I was under the, it wasn't live, I guess, the way it was, it must be a delay. Sorry. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Edmondson, and my child is a student at Carroll County. I'm a solutions person, not a create more problems for the sake of creating problems type of person. November 2nd, COVID shots were made available for all school-aged children. That means anyone who wanted to choose that option to protect themselves or protect their children have now had a little over 16 weeks to do so. Sufficient time and multiple options have been available to everyone who wants extra protections. There are so many mitigation strategies like the N95 respirators or whatever this thing is called. This one only protects the wearer, so anyone else can choose to wear this, to smile. As Dr. McBride from Johns Hopkins recommended, at this point, it is time to remove the mandate on masks. There has been enough time to evaluate the options, assess the data, and make a personal choice. With regard to the off-ramps that the state has provided, please don't feed me lies that has out of concern for the health of our children, especially when our children are handling this virus about the same or better as any seasonal flu. Bureaucrats with their one-size-fits-all solutions would rather push an experimental shot that does not prevent you from getting COVID and that does not prevent you from spreading COVID. An experimental shot that is also known to have serious adverse reactions and to cause myocarditis, especially in younger males. If this were truly about health and protection, they would have been counting the number of students and teachers who have had COVID, which is proven to give long lasting immunity. Why isn't the percentage of people who have gotten the virus and survived an off ramp? Because it's not about that, right? And at this point, we need to do away with the off-ramps completely. As parents, we know the risks and the choice should be up to us. You decided last fall that you know better than us, the parents, the people that have painstakingly spent our lives caring for and protecting our children. Have you ever thought that you might need protecting from yourselves too? Which is exactly why the constitution was written, to protect the people from the government. This is your chance now. The ball is in your court. Make masking optional. Allow parents to make this decision for their children. This is how it should have been from the beginning. And I demand that the AELR committee votes to abolish this gross overreach of legislation and let us live our lives as free and brave Marylanders, as proud Americans. Continuing this policy is unacceptable. It is unconstitutional what you, the state, and this committee have done by overriding local jurisdictions. Enough is enough. I pray that you make the right decision today and end this mandatory policy effective immediately. For the sake of our children, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edmondson. We appreciate your, your input. And just for the, the sake of, of those watching at home, this is a regulation. It is not a piece of legislation. The AELR committee only has the power to approve or not approve up or down a regulation that is before us, an emergency regulation that's before us. We don't have the ability to amend or change it in any way. It is not legislation, it's a regulation. I just want to clarify for folks at home. Okay, Ms. Hart. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? We can, Hello. yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me one second. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kit Hart. I am the mom five and the chair for the Carroll County Moms for Liberty chapter. Um, I represent thousands of parents whose voices have been gaslit and doxxed, ignored and suppressed. For two years, mothers and fathers across our 24 counties voiced our concerns about mandatory masking at our local school boards. That's roughly 480 testimonials a month. When you directed the MDE to enforce masking throughout the state, only 10 parents per hearing were able to speak. You silenced 98% of us when you did that. 
By doing so, you dishonored and defiled the democratic values that you say you hold so dear. Since then, we have been beholden to the most fearful among us. Our children have suffered in ways in which we are only just beginning to understand in order to make you feel safe. In the words of Nelson Mandela, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than by the way in which it treats its children. By that measure, our own government is guilty of child abuse. You and others in power have treated healthy children as untouchable vectors of disease, forcing them to bear a burden that was never theirs to carry. You have inflicted psychological damage by denying them their very humanity. And why? One answer, because you could. While adults are able to live as freely as we choose, childhoods are being trampled by your policies. If you had told me at the beginning of the school year that my children could breathe freely if I submitted to a masking policy every day, I wouldn't have thought twice. I would wear that pointless facial decoration everywhere so that my children could have a chance at normalcy. We, the adults, should be the ones sacrificing for our children, not the other way around. Now you're at the point that from a political perspective, it only makes sense to pass this bill. But this must never happen again. We know now what emergency regulations indicate. We understand what you mean when you say it's for your own good. We will never forget when the playgrounds were ghoulishly plastered in tape the same spring that our children's friends and activities were ripped away from them. We will never forget when you erected plexiglass partitions treating our children like lepers. We will never forget the proms that never happened, the championship games that were never played, or the graduation caps that were never tossed. These totalitarian policies will never happen again because we, the people, will never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Ms. Parsons? Persons? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darlene Persons. I have two granddaughters and one grandson that go to Maryland Public Schools. They are in eighth, sixth, and first, gr first grade. I am here to speak for them and many other children that are affected by the mass mandate regulation that is now rescinded by MSDE and that was made a regulation by the AELR on January 5th, 2022. These masks do more harm than good to our kids. They cause them anxiety, depression, speech delays, and many other mental, social, and physical and learning problems. Governor Hogan said in his letter to the MSDE that it is critical to move towards normalcy for students and families by rescinding the school masking policy. After the MSDE's vote uh, to rescind, the governor has asked the ALER to do the same. In Maryland, over 95% of adults and 90% of age five years and older have received at least one vaccine. Hospitalizations are below 500. Our positivity is 2.78 and the case rate is 10.35 per 100,000 people and it is dropping every single day. The AELR wouldn't have been involved in the mass mandate if they hadn't been asked by the MSDE to make it a regulation in the first place. Now that the MSDE has voted to rescind the mass mandate and give it back to the local school boards, where it should be anyway, we are asking the ALLR to ratify the MSDE's mass mandate today, their decision today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Persons. We appreciate your input. Ms. Stonesifer? Hi, uh, yes. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that I registered unfavorable, but I believe I needed to register favorable, so I apologize for that error. I'm asking that this regulation be removed. Um, thank you for giving me a few minutes to speak. There's been a lot of talk about slowing the spread and wearing a mask to protect the vulnerable. But if masking our youth is doing more, har more harm than good, then we should consider not doing that. I want to give you a different perspective today because not all kids are doing okay and adapting well to the mass masking. So let me give you an example of Johnny. Johnny has ADHD, which puts him at increased risk for depression and anxiety. Johnny suffers with low self-confidence, disorganization, and forgetfulness. 
He also has a sensory sensitivity. In the last two years, he has learned which mask he can wear so that it's not always distracting him. The problem is, is when he forgets to replenish the stock in his backpack, he has to wear one provided to him by the school. Call that day a loss for getting any learning in, and hopefully he doesn't have a behavioral issue caused from the overstimulation. These are mild impacts made to Johnny due to his mask. The long-term mental health problems for Johnny could be life-threatening. Remember at the beginning, I explained that individuals with ADHD are at increased risk for anxiety and depression? Well, Johnny has been fast-tracked to these disorders with the introduction of mass masking. Johnny's low self-confidence, which is highly common in individuals with ADHD, has been even worse, as his inability to now read facial expressions makes him assume his teachers are always upset with him and he is not accepted by his peers. As two years approaches, his development of anxiety and depression worsening, his life becomes at risk. Does Johnny's life matter? Is he as important as Susan, who might be immune compromised? Which child do you protect? The 2.6% of children who are immune compromised from a virus that might kill them using a mitigation strategy with a statistical insignificant benefit, where one-way masking is also a mitigation strategy that is only marginally less effective, or the 9.4% of children with ADHD, the 7.1% of children with anxiety, the 3.2% of children with depression. We need to consider all of the children, not just some of the children. I'm asking that you please remove this regulation so that parents can have a choice to do what's best for their child, the child they understand the best. Thank you. Thank you, we appreciate your input. Ms. Goshorn. Hi, my name is Melissa Masusi Goshorn and I'm the Maryland State Director of the Power to Parent Union and a parent to three children in Calvert County Public Schools. I'm here today to urge you to rescind the statewide mask mandate in Maryland. The rights of parents to care, custody, and nurture of their children is of such character that it cannot be denied without violating those fundamental principles of liberty and justice, which lie at the base of all, all our civil and political institutions. And such right is a fundamental right protected by this amendment first and amendment 5, 9, and 14. This was from Doe versus Irwin in 1985. Our children have been used as political palms for far too long during this pandemic. Our babies need smiles, education, normalcy. Our children deserve this because they were never at risk to begin with. And we've known this for months, if not even the better part of two years. This isn't about vaccination. This isn't about masks. This isn't about science. This isn't a public health issue. This is an abuse of power issue at the expense of our children, a parental rights issue and a, humans right, a human rights issue for our children. You need to vote to rescind this mandate because it was an abuse of power to enforce it to begin with. But I'm not simply asking that you rescind this mandate today. I am urging you to ensure a mandate that removes parental rights is never approved or enforced again. I will end with this. It is your responsibility and the responsibility of state leaders to ensure our school systems get the funding they need to fix the damage that you and your colleagues have caused all of these children. Keeping our kids out of school and masks on their faces for far longer than is medically or scientifically required has re required significant lifelong impacts that you are now responsible for paying for. Vote responsibly on this, but vote responsibly on future bills that impact parental rights in our children. They are the future of this state and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you to every person who participated both in the hearing or sent written communication. Uh, we cannot do our jobs without that participation. So we greatly appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Melissa Goshorn, oh, followed no. by. Actually, that, that was our last written, witness that I have. Oh. Unless Staff tells oh, me I that. got it. Yes, yes. The ones that follow are written. Yes. And I stand corrected. Thank you. Um, can I assume that most of the members uh, have had an opportunity to multitask and to review the CDC guidelines? Uh, 
because I think it is important that for those who want to have their decision um, influenced by and in take into consideration the uh, judgment of the CDC that we give you an adequate opportunity to do that. Does, is there anyone who needs additional time? Okay. Seeing none, I think we'll recess for a minute so staff can prepare uh, to uh, call the roll. We'll be back in one minute at 3.36. Thank you. And I would also thank all the members of the public uh, who testified. I mean, we are here, we work for you, and we appreciate uh, what you've taught, what you've said today. Thank you. Eighteen members. Uh, I believe a quorum is present. Okay, and Mr. Chair, I think we should allow folks the opportunity to explain their vote in a reasonable amount of time, should they ask. Certainly, good idea. Thank you. Will the clerk? Okay, just to remind everybody a vote yes is a vote to rescind the regulations. A vote yes rescinds the regulations. Rescinds the regulation and throws it back to the counties and local school boards to make the decision. Just crystal clear, this is a complex regulation here. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Council, please call the roll and everyone, anyone who wishes to make a statement, a brief statement, please do so as your name is called. Council. Senator, Senator Augustine. Yes. Uh, Senator Carter. I don't believe is here. Uh, Senator Cassily. Yes. Senator Eckert. Very much. Yes. Thank you. Senator Hayes? Yes. Senator Hershey? Yes, and it is refreshing to see the voice of the people still matters. Senator Smith? Yes. Senator Waldstriker? Yes. Senator Young? Yes. Delegate Buckle? Yes. Delegate Holmes? Yes. Delegate Jacobs? Yes. Delegate Learman? I vote yes. 
I get, I just like to explain, you know, my hope is certainly that local school districts will be guided by public health and not politics as we move forward. I think everybody on this committee has done its best to be guided by public health and guided by looking out for our kids. Um, and I, it's frustrating to see that some members don't, uh, some people who testified today don't believe that. Um, many of us are parents. And I appreciated having all the testimony today, especially the testimony from those who, who really were thoughtful in how they were approaching this um, and shared their stories with us. So I certainly hope that our local school districts moving forward will be guided by public health and it's refreshing to see things moving in the right direction in Maryland. Thanks. Delegate McComas? Yes. Delegate Resnick? Yes, and if I can take 20 seconds to just say that, um, you know, to the school districts that if they choose to continue this masking policy, that is exactly in line with this regulation. They are not defying us, the Department of Health or the governor. They are being allowed by this regulation to do what they feel is best, and we are supporting them in that effort. Thank you. Delegate Sample Hughes. My response is no, and I want to explain my vote, if I may. Um, you know, I listened to all the testimony and all the emails and all the phone calls I've gotten during this meeting just now, and I just wanted to make a statement as it, as it relates to the comments about us abusing children. I would say, please don't put that in that same category. When you have a child that is traumatized and, and, and truly abused, um, don't put it in the same category as wearing a mask um, to protect the child. Uh, so to that end, I thought that was very disappointing. The other thing that we still need to remember is that on the school buses that our kids ride, and particularly um, need to know that they'll still have to wear these face coverings. So let's not mislead anyone on that end. And then the last thing I'll say, um, as it relates to, uh, I think it was Ms. Collins, she referenced her disabled child um, and wanting to make sure that they're able to attend school. So at this juncture, my, my decision is no. Um, I came to this meeting with a different mindset, but certainly this is where I am at this time. Thank you for allowing me to explain. Delegate Shoemaker. Uh, yes, and very briefly, just to explain, I mean, this uh, uh, decision that we're making today in voting to uh, uphold the action taken at the State Board of Election, uh, State Board of Education uh, in rescinding the, reg uh, the regulation and uh, allowing local boards to make the determination on their own in consultation with the parents that they serve in their local community is that which I've advocated for uh, since the start of this controversy back in September. So I'm a, I'm a firm yes. Chair Elfrith. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I will be voting yes and in briefly explaining my vote. I, I know that many, everybody on this call for the last number of years and certainly the last few days in deciding how to vote today has consulted parents in our districts, health officials, educators in our districts to make this decision. I continue to be concerned about potential impacts on our youngest students in school, those who are not yet able to be vaccinated, as well as our more senior educators who are in the classroom who are more vulnerable to this disease. At the same time, there has not been a single easy decision in the last two years of this pandemic, and this is not one even today, despite maybe what some folks might feel. These are all challenging, difficult decisions. Um, in voting yes, I am encouraging, strongly encouraging our local jurisdictions to continue to be guided by the best public health data uh, and with the thought that we are um, still one school community and we are still one community and uh, we need to make sure that we are looking out for each other through that lens. Thank you. Chair Rosenberg. I vote aye and I vote aye as uh, I have in the past on this on this issue, uh, doing as best I can to take into account uh, the medical uh, the medical advice, the best scientific evidence that we've gotten from the CDC that I believe the State Board of Education has tried to take into account in its uh, deliberations. I respect the decisions of all the members uh, of this body. Uh, the, the ALR committee and the greater body and uh, 
Yes, I'm voting yes. Okay, uh, 17 yes, one no, and one absence. Okay, that completes the business of the committee. I thank you all. Uh, our children will be better for the work that we've done over the past months, and we are adjourned. And thank you. Thank you all, and thank you to the staff.